Before the virus, mid-October through the first week of November was the normal window for fans to maybe see a sports equinox. All four major professional leagues playing games on the same day was more rare than an actual equinox. No one talked about this being a sports equinox at all. I mean, it was all Diamondbacks. Game 7. Bruce Cooper is thinking back on November 4th, 2001, and the biggest baseball game he covered during more than three decades at Channel 12. In the ninth inning, the revered and respected sportscaster made his way down to near the third base dugout. Some of the media started coming down because you're anticipating going onto the field if this happens, you know, if the uh, unusual, the unexpected happens. And so you're, you're there just waiting for that moment. And I didn't think it was going to come to fruition, but it did. Arizona won the World Series. The Diamondbacks, built by Jerry Colangelo, were only four years old. And they came back to defeat the Goliath Yankees, who had come to symbolize New York post 9-11. Bruce remembers the 10 p.m. newscast aimed to cover every angle of the D-backs having just won Arizona's first major pro sports championship. We covered it from A to Z at the end of the sports cast. It was, oh, by the way, Suns, Coyotes, and Cardinals all lost today. Just, oh, by the way, mentioned them all three clumped together. The local hockey, football, and basketball teams having games, too, was simply back page news. And it still would have been, even if they'd won. I've done a little research myself, and I found out that Phoenix is the only city, the only city ever to take part in all four of those sports on that one particular date and time, the sports equinox. It's a credential big enough on its own to establish Metro Phoenix as a sports capital, and wrapped up inside is the most important victory in local sports history. But it was just one day. What gives this sports town even broader appeal is being the yearly site for more than a month of games, tournaments, and races. February is midseason for two of the major sports. Then comes the Phoenix Open, the Cactus League, and NASCAR. Bruce especially remembers this sports bonanza in 2015 when the Super Bowl was also in town. No doubt about it, that period of time, I'm like, this is crazy. We had media, uh, uh, NBC affiliates coming in all over the country. Everyone wanted to see if you could get them either Phoenix Suns, Arizona Coyotes, or the open tickets. Hey, hey can you hook us up? Everyone wanted to do that. It, it was just insane. It was insane. March is always the peak. Spring breakers drive rental cars slowly on our asphalt jungle gym of freeways. You need a reservation to get a table at a restaurant. Sky Harbor sets passenger records as tourists head to and from resorts. It was all happening like normal this year. Then the virus hit and basketball shut down first. Here's Business Channel CNBC. At the NBA shocking the sports world last night. The game tonight has been postponed. You are all safe. In a flash, the Suns were done at the downtown Phoenix Arena. Hockey stopped the Coyotes' first playoff push out of Westgate Entertainment District in years. Fear of the virus forced Major League Baseball to empty all seats in our 10 spring training parks. The pandemic had swiftly tanked the national sports industry. TV personalities suddenly faced having no games to dissect or players to criticize. On the Fox show Undisputed, longtime sports journalist Skip Bayless talked about living in a sports bubble as the danger became clear. And all of a sudden, last night, my bubble got punctured and invaded by the realist of life. Basically infected. Infected. It got infected. And it became life and death mm -hmm. last night, right before my very eyes. From KJZZ Original Productions, I'm Matthew Casey, and this is Empty Seats, a podcast about the pandemic versus the sports capitals in Metro Phoenix. It was all games off for months after the virus first swept through the U.S., and though they've returned, it's still not safe for fans to fill the stands. In Chapter 3, we'll meet a stadium concessions manager who's been out of work since March, and we'll visit a homegrown special events company fighting to survive. Oh, this is different from the mini ball one. Ooh. 
Chris Baker plays Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout on a live stream via Twitch. The platform is a branch of Amazon that lets you watch video gamers do their thing on the internet. The green character played by Chris races against dozens of other online gamers to get through an obstacle course fast enough to make the next battle royale. Oh, that was the last one. Chris has had a lot more time to play video games this year. The pandemic shut down his other personal passion, charity work that uses superhero cosplay to help children, cancer patients, abuse victims, first responders, and military families. Chris grew up on an Air Force post. Um, base brats and I'll support them till my last dying breath. <laughs> Military's everything for us. The virus made Chris's workspace unsafe, too. He was a concession supervisor for a company that's contracted to feed crowds of fans at Arizona State University athletic events. It's devastating. We stopped working on 310 of this year. I first talked to Chris in May. He was on a daily quest to talk with a real person at the State Economic Security Department about his unemployment claim. The money finally came. Arizona's meager payments were twice boosted by federal help. But that's over now, and Chris only gets $117 a week. 2020 is just a, hor a horrible year. We just need to get to 2021, take a deep breath, and move forward. Going to school was Chris's goal when he first moved to Arizona about 20 years ago. He took a job at Olive Garden to get in-state tuition. Ten years passed, and he was still waiting tables. Despite having learned all the different roles, Chris did not get a chance to be a manager. He found a new job at the TGI Fridays in Chase Field, where senior waitstaff had locks on the table sections where Diamondbacks fans want to sit on game day. You get started in this back room that didn't have views of the field and stuff, so it, you, didn't, you didn't last there very long unless you could stick it out past that. Another ballpark restaurant job didn't work out for Chris either. He really wanted a change from relying on tips, a word that some say stands for to ensure prompt or proper service. But a good tip, 20% or more of a total bill, for good service is not guaranteed. Certain restaurants make servers tell the government how much they made in tips based on their sales. So bad tips can mean that someone like Chris had to pay taxes on money he didn't actually make. These are the things that we deal with as a server, you know. It's, it's like gambling. It's like gambling with your pay. Doing charity work had helped Chris figure out he wanted to become an event coordinator. But first he had to get experience. So I figured working as a supervisor and working in um, stadiums and in events would help to justify that, that transition. He took a job as a fast food restaurant manager, and he got hired by the ASU athletics contractor, which he'd heard about from a concessions manager he met while working at Chase Field. Sta stadium work is hugely different than, <laughs> you know, uh, a bar or in a restaurant. Chris spent the first season working in the kitchen and washing dishes. He earned a chance to supervise one concession stand. Then he rose to oversee all of the concessions on one side of Sun Devil Stadium. That to me was a step up. I earned, you know, eight more dollars an hour from what I earned previously, and then all my money is guaranteed to be my money. <laughs> Chris could basically make his own hours and keep doing charity work during the week, as long as he told his boss when he'd be in and hit his numbers. I was very happy, and I was, I was moving up in my um, lines of where I'd want to be and working. Enough that Chris was able to quit the second job. Now the 43-year-old's top priority for going back to work is being able to protect himself. The politicizing of masks makes taking a restaurant job where pay depends on tips even more dicey. Chris worries customers will leave him less money because he chooses to wear a mask. And that has nothing to do with the quality of service he gave them. I don't want to go back to, to waiting and bartending. If I have to, I have to, but it's like I work my way out of that industry, out of doing that. You know, I'll go, I would rather go do manual labor than that. And could he even get hired? Restaurants can't run at normal capacity and still face the prospect of having to close again due to an outbreak. Still, the purpose of Chris's sports venue job is tied to fans not just being allowed to watch a game in person, but also feeling safe enough to go. His biggest fear is the uncertainty of what's to come. I can get by on top of ramen and water, but I mean, it, it's just like paying the bills and everything else is, yeah. How's it going? Hey, how's it going, Jim? Morning, man. Thanks. Jim Rounds runs his economic and policy consulting firm from downtown Tempe. 
I'm here to talk with him about the role of sports in the state's leisure and hospitality industry, which the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics said employed about 325,000 Arizonans in 2019. What has the pandemic done to that part of our, of our state? It's really destroyed the economics of tourism. Uh, it's going to be temporary, though. Tourism is also part of leisure and hospitality, currently down about 50,000 jobs. Jim says tourism is hurting more than any other industry in the state, and it needs help. You can go down the entire sports list and tie each one at least to uh, tourism in some way. Travel restrictions, the initial economic shutdown, and no fans at games drove the destruction of this cornerstone industry. Metro Phoenix has 19 sports venues and seven pro teams that combined play about 200 home games each year. Jim breaks down the labor force that makes these places and organizations go. A, a large portion of them, of the workers, um, are contract workers. You end up seeing the same vendors and other employees at a hockey game or a basketball game or a baseball game. There's also government workers and different team employees based in the venues. Jerry Colangelo is Phoenix's most successful and longest tenured sports executive. He says the virus put people running pro teams in a terrible position. In addition to the players themselves, these bosses have lots of full and part-time employees working for them. Billions and billions of dollars have been lost forever. Now, what happens in the future? It's, it remains to be seen. We don't know. Colangelo says leagues have resumed games without fans because there are big TV contracts with a lot of money on the line. That's why it's so important before there's any further collapse to our economy. And here we're talking sports, but I'm talking about business across the board. When everyone is taking such a hit and jobs are lost and incomes are gone and profits dwindle to nothing, um, you know, at the end of the day, what, what's left? There is a real job to be done in rebuilding our uh, economy because we've taken a major, major hit and we won't see a recovery for years. Jim the Economist forecasts that Arizona can recover jobs lost to the pandemic by the end of next year. But he warns that getting back those 50,000 leisure and hospitality jobs might lag into 2022. He says the sooner the crowds come back, the sooner there will be demand for the contract employees who work at sports venues. Unfortunately, they're making minimum wage, which even if you're working full time, will not help your family. Of those 50,000 jobs we've lost, do you have an idea how many of those are these contract workers? I think that it's a smaller percentage uh, only because we have a very large tourism industry in the state. But it almost doesn't matter if it's a small percentage because it's still a number of people that are in need of help. Jim believes hospitality and leisure can bounce back faster in Arizona if the state pumps up to $20 million into the tourism industry over the next two years. He believes the money would help keep people in business and recapture pent-up demand for travel. Then when it's safe, Arizonans would be excited to explore their home state again, and outsiders would come here to do things like watch sporting events in person. So if we can get more people to come back and we have larger crowds, once we get through the COVID issue, of course, larger crowds uh, sooner than later, then there'll be demand for these workers. A worker backs up a forklift inside the cavernous Phoenix warehouse belonging to Pro-M National Event Services. Brady Castro owns part of the company. It's a quarter million square feet. Uh, we house pretty much everything that we own here on property. Pro-M was born as a local parking company in the 1980s. Brady started in the late 90s, taking money at ASU football games. Pro-M merged with and absorbed several companies during the 2000s. It now has locations in four cities. Sports had made up about 40% of business in Arizona. I asked if the warehouse for one of the largest rental event companies in the country would typically have more people working. Yes, we normally have a lot more staff in here because again, what we'd be doing is we'd be getting all this stuff ready and clean to go out to the TPC. TPC Scottsdale is home of the Phoenix Open. Organizers recently said they're planning to host some golf fans at the tournament next February, but most of the hospitality spaces, which include the suites where high rollers eat, drink, and party, won't get built. 
Uh, I think it's still going to be a good event no matter how many fans show up. It's, it's always a great time out there, but it's for us, uh, that, one, that one was tough. Because one of Pro-Am's specialties is the large tents that shelter these spaces. People don't think about a lot of times that if you're a guy that puts up a 30-meter tent structure, that that's a way to feed your family. Those guys have been doing this for 20 years. They make decent money, and those structures, the things that they put up, are very, very highly engineered, complex buildings, um, and it is a skill set. It's This event industry is, is a place that you can actually make a good living uh, if you're willing to work for it. Brady remembers the world starting to change during the Phoenix Open this year. You know, there was, I'm going to call it even rumblings about a virus and in China and this and that, and I don't think any of us thought even twice about it. And then as, then as it really kind of exploded and started going all across Europe and across the country and got into America, and I think the first big wake up for us was when spring training canceled. Other events fell like dominoes, and Pro-Am's business dropped 90% from last year, Brady says. One approach to the crisis has been for companies to cut operations down to the bone just to keep the lights on. Pro-Am considered this, but ultimately decided to try and keep its core group so it can be ready to do large-scale jobs when they come back. Pro-Am sought a federal Paycheck Protection Program loan and has done events it could find, like COVID-19 testing sites. We did have to do some furloughs, we did have to do some layoffs, some other cost-cutting measures, but really I think our investor group, you know, and kudos to them, is behind us. I know a lot of people don't have that luxury and understand that this is a long play. How long partly depends on establishing what sort of liability a company like Pro-M would face if fans are allowed back into sports venues and someone gets sick. Brady says there's a lack of clarity on that issue and the nature of the virus itself. We're going to be the last to open, you know, after everybody else is back. I think then large-scale special events, the Coachellas, the Lollapaloozas, the football at 100% capacity, the things that really move the needle for us will come back. Brady still fears that it may never happen or it will take longer than anybody thinks. Chatter among industry peers is the comeback could start during the second quarter of 2021. So that's what he's hoping for. For us, Pro-Am, uh, getting events and getting sports back is huge. And I know for our economy as a whole, it's, it's the hotels and the rental cars and the restaurant workers and the bartenders and the, everybody else. It's, it's critical for this to come back because Arizona is such a tourism, hospitality-based economy. Metro Phoenix was in the middle of its yearly spring sports pageant when the pandemic suddenly stopped all games and emptied all seats in our stadiums, arenas, and ballparks. Chris Baker immediately lost his concession supervisor job that he hoped would help him start a new career. Workers like him are part of Arizona's large leisure and hospitality industry that hemorrhaged jobs. And a homegrown special events company that got a big chunk of its work through live sports saw its business drop by 90% from last year. In Chapter 4, we'll visit the Valley's sports capitals, where even though games have restarted, the fans remain mostly exiled. For KJZZ Original Productions, I'm Matthew Casey.